We're continuing our series this morning. We're so glad that you could be here. And if you've been coming for a while, you know we've been going through a series dealing with cover to cover, Jesus in all of the Bible. And uh, I've got something for the kids that we're going to put up. Our, our subject today is especially dealing with Ruth. And it's talking about reaping, redemption, and rest. But before I delve into that, I've got a picture I want to put on the screen for the kids. And I, I guess anyone can take a look. You see that beautiful painting there of tigers. Now, how many tigers do you see in the picture? Most people would say there's four. I see some are saying six. Some would say ten. All right, let me do the great reveal now. Put up the next slide. There are 15 tigers in that picture. They are hidden in the foliage. But if you look carefully, you see the face of tigers in every one of those red circles. Now, when we study the Old Testament, we are looking at pictures of Jesus that are hidden in the story. And so you've noticed we've been doing that, and we're going to do that again today. So let's dive in, and we're going to turn to the book of Ruth. We're going to try and get all the way through. It's only four chapters. It's a beautiful love story. You know, the Bible's got several love stories, and everyone likes a nice love story. I heard about, um, about 20 girls were going to a Christian college, and they were in the dormitory having a prayer meeting. And one of the girls prayed and said, Lord, give us pure hearts. And another girl piped up and said, give us clean hearts. And then one said rather eagerly, and give us sweethearts. <laughs> and then all of them said, amen. <laughs> so Ruth is a beautiful love story. Now, it's an interesting book in that, first of all, this is the only story, only book in the Bible that is named after uh, one of the ancestors of Jesus. Ruth is an ancestor of Jesus, and it tells us from first to last in the book about that. Uh, the other interesting thing, it's one of two books in the Bible named after a woman. It's the only book in the Old Testament that is named after a Gentile. New Testament, Luke was very likely Greek or a, a Gentile. But uh, it's a fascinating book, and it also just jumps out of the Bible. It's dealing with, the Bible is going through a historical nar narrative following the history of a nation, and suddenly it jumps to the history of a family. And we'll understand why as we proceed. So if you look in the book of Luke, chapter 1, I'm just going to introduce it. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Well, what were those days like? If you just look back one uh, sentence into the book of Judges, the book of Judges closes by saying, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So Ruth probably lived during the time of the judge Ehud. And it may have overlapped the time when a king named Eglon, who was a Moabite, had conquered Israel. And so the Israelites may have been during this time subservient to the Moabites. So that plays into the story came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah, he went to dwell in the country of Moab and his wife and his two sons with him. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife was Naomi and the names of his two sons were Malion and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judea. The reason it mentions Ephrathites is there is a Bethlehem in the north. It's kind of like in America. I think we got three towns called Farmington. And you got several Portlands, at least two Portlands, right? Portland, Maine, Portland, Oregon. Well, there was a couple of Bethlehems. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, right there, it seems strange that you would have a famine in a house of bread. Bethlehem, first of all, do we find Bethlehem in the story of Jesus? Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. And Jesus is the bread of life. It's interesting that he was born and placed in a manger. So here you have the bread of life born in the house of bread and placed in a manger, a vessel for holding bread. And uh, grain has a lot to do with this story as well. Could you have a famine among the people of God in the house of bread? Have you read the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11? 
Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they'll wander from sea to sea and from north to east and run to and fro, seeking the word. You notice it doesn't say running from north to south, from north to east, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. During the time of Judges, there was a famine for the word of God. There were some godly people that were living in Israel. We'll find out about Boaz in just a moment. But as a nation, it says, oh boy, if you read the book of Judges, I mean, they, they had one tribe just about annihilate another tribe because of a heinous crime and, and they're making idols and there's just lots of things happening that weren't healthy. And you read about Samson, in spite of his good deeds, he had girlfriends here and there and they're not obeying all the commandments of God. So God allowed them to experience this famine. So during that time of famine, instead of bringing revival, Elimelech, we think he, he made a bad move. See, Elimelech might have thought, well, Abraham, during a famine, he went to Egypt. Isaac, during a famine, he went to the Philistines. Jacob, during a famine, they went down to Egypt. And so nothing wrong with me leaving the promised land during a famine. But that was before they were settled in the promised land. He probably should have stayed there and he would have fared a lot better. But he went to the land of the Gentiles. And as a result, his boys married Gentiles. And God said, do not let your sons marry unbelievers. 99% of the time, it doesn't work out. Ruth ended up being a rare exception. So he goes down to the land of the Philistines. And he migrates to Moab. Now, um, in this migration, uh, he wasn't necessarily supposed to be going to the pagans. He might need to endure hardship with the pe people of God like Moses did rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There was food in Moab, but they worshiped Chemosh. They worshiped pagan gods, and they were even involved. You can read one story where a Moabite king sacrificed his son to stop a war. They were involved in human sacrifice. So, yeah, things might have been scant there. He also made a bad financial decision. As you read on, you'll find out he had to mortgage his land and his house to get the money for the move, but they had plenty of money to establish their new life. Because later, Naomi says, we went out of Bethlehem full. So they had some cash. They said, we're going to go start a new life. We'll get through this famine. But uh, they come back empty. Now, just a little amazing fact I thought I'd throw in is the Moabites. As you can see, Moab was a country that was southeast of Israel. You can see Jerusalem is the red star, Bethlehem nearby, right in the middle. Uh, the Moabites were related to Lot. You remember Lot had committed incest with his daughters, and he had two sons, Ammon and Moab. And there you've got the Ammonites who are north of Moab. You get the Moabites, and you get the Edomites related to Esau that were south of there. Uh, there was an interesting discovery in the 1800s. Next picture. It's called the Moabite Stone. And this stone that was found by missionaries it had an ancient inscription on it that uh, they were able to translate. It was, I think, Paleo-Hebrew or something. But um, it's broken up when they found it. it. It had been busted up by the locals, but they were able to patch most of it together. I've seen this in person in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And it talks about Misha, the king of Moab, and his conquering of Israel, specifically mentions them. So this is, this, these countries and this event and time that we're reading about is well-established as history. So we're getting some insights now into the personal lives of the people back then. You know things aren't going to go well for Elimelech because um, though his name means my God is king, his son Mal Malalon's name means sickly, Chilion's name means pining one. And so um, it tells us as you read on in the story that he dies and then instead of going home, you know, Naomi's thinking that the boys, have, they're in school here, let them graduate. Well, they get girlfriends, as often is the case. And uh, they marry these Moabite girls. Um, one is named Orpah, and the other is named Ruth, and they dwell there about 10 years. But then both Malion and Chilion die, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband, and that's Naomi. Then she arose, I'm in verse 6 of chapter 1 with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she heard the country, in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread, meaning in Bethlehem. 
Therefore she went out from that place where she was, she and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now it was good manners back then if someone was moving away and you might never see them again, you'd see them on their way and you'd go with them. You notice Abraham did that when the Lord and the angels were leaving. He went with them on the way, part of the way. And they did this with Paul. They kind of go with them on the way. And Karen used to always tell me, Doug, when your company's leaving, get up and see them to the door. And I'd say just, you know, goodbye. I'd sit there on the couch right when you find work. And you know, she'd say, get up, you know, go. So I've learned. I stand in the door. It's getting better. But it was a custom back then. You'd see them on the way. Well, finally, they kind of reach the point where it's getting absurd. And Naomi turns around and says, look, you've got to go back. Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, return each of you to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me, your husbands and me. The Lord grant that you might rest each of you in the house of her husband. She's saying, I hope you find another husband. They're young women. So she kissed them and they lift up their voices and wept. And they said, no, surely we'll return with you to your people. But Naomi says, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, for I'm too old to have a husband. And should I have hope? And should I have a husband even tonight? And should I bear sons? Would you wait for them till they are grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughter, it grieves me very much for your sake. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, you might wonder why she's saying this. It was the custom that if uh, a husband died, that his brother was to take the wife. And I know that sounds strange to us, but back then there were often many more women than men and, uh, because of the wars. And that's why you read that verse in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread. Don't worry, you won't have to buy us bread. We'll wear our own apparel. We'll buy our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. They had no welfare system back then. And if you had no children to take care of you in your old age, you'd be destitute. You'd be begging. And so you can remember where Judah's son died. And Judah says to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, wait until Selah is grown up. And, but she, she, he had this young boy, and she's supposed to wait for this young boy to grow up to marry her. That was the custom. That's why Naomi is saying something absurd. She said, even if I got married tonight and had kids, are you going to wait 20 years? So that's why she's making that statement, because of that law. So they lifted up their voices, and they wept again. And Orpah kissed, I always want to say Oprah, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And I think that's an interesting point I'd like to just um, underscore. Uh, some kiss Jesus, but they don't follow him. Ruth also kissed her, but she clung to her. Some kiss, but they do not cleave. Do you know it's a similar word that's used for marriage? Adam was to cleave unto his wife. That means we're to be joined, and it is a firm commitment. So then she says, no, Ruth, go back. And Ruth makes this incredible declaration. Look at, look at this together. Now, if you look in the book of Ruth, in uh, chapter 1, verse 16, if you underline in your Bible, this is one you should underline. Ruth said to Naomi, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Thy people will be my people, and thy God my God. Where you die, there will I die, and there I'll be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she, Naomi, saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking to her. She said, I am determined to follow you. The statement of Ruth, it's beautiful to read at a wedding. Uh, it talks about commitment. But it's even more beautiful for a Christian. For every believer, if we would say, Lord, where you go, I will go. Your people, my people. Even though they got problems, your people are my people. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Where you die, they're all dying. They're all be buried. Meaning that it's going to be an eternal connection. And that's the commitment that every Christian needs to say that we've got that resolution. Uh, someone, unnamed author, said, See the power of resolution. It silences temptation. Those that go in religious ways without steadfast minds stand like a door half open that's inviting a thief. 
but resolution shuts and bolts the door, it resists the devil and forces him to flee. If we would all be resolved, there's a great sermon book by Joe Cruz, it's called The Power of a Positive No. And it talks about how good it is for you when you make up your mind to just be resolved in your decision. I remember when I quit smoking, someone told me, Doug, tell everybody that you've quit. Because what it does is it seals your resolution when you're, and that's why when you get married, it's a public declaration. You're making a commitment. It's a resolution. So Ruth said, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And she did. So they said goodbye to Orpah, and they went on together to Israel. And she comes to Israel, and the people see her, and they say, oh, I remember Naomi when Elimelech left and her boys. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, but call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt with me. And that's where you get the word Mary. Do you find that in the story of Jesus? Mara, the Lord has dealt very bitter, bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. She, they had money when they left, and now they're bankrupt. Her land has been mortgaged. The only way that she can take possession of the land again, her husband has gone to work, her, her sons, she needs someone to redeem the debt on her house. She has nothing. So the book of Ruth is also about redemption. She needs somebody to rescue her from her poverty, and Ruth ends up becoming the key in this. So if you go to chapter 2, it tells us here that um, now you find gleaning and grace. After they get back, it says, Ruth the Moabitess says, and I'm in verse 2 of Ruth chapter 2. I'm skipping over verse 1. I'll come back there. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I will find grace. Now, I don't know what version you're reading. Some might say favor, but that word there is a word in Hebrew for grace. So they're looking for grace because they have nothing. And you and I are bankrupt. We need grace. Amen? Amen? And so she comes to Bethlehem looking for grace. Does that speak to Jesus? And Naomi comes in. She's using the name Mara or bitterness. And uh, she's asking, can I go glean in a field? Now, gleaning, you'll find the law in Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10, where it says, don't completely take every single olive off your tree and every single grain out of the field. Leave some of it that naturally is there. Don't go back and beat the branches twice. Leave some for the poor and the destitute and the widows. And so it was a custom that when they were reaping, invariably some of the sheaves would fall and some grains would be missed. And the poor would follow after the reapers and pick up what was left behind getting the scraps, if you will. So, so she said, let me see if I can go glean and get something there. So the whole book of Ruth is in the context of a harvest. So many of Jesus' parables talked about a harvest. He talked about separating the wheat from the chairs and, and the Lord of the harvest who's going to come with a sickle in his hand. He's pictured in Revelation in the context of a harvest. And, and so it's got the language of the New Testament all through here. Now, in the ver first verse of chapter 2, it introduces the man named Boaz. And you read about him, and it tells us that he is, uh, in many ways, he is a type of Christ. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, Limelech, a man of great wealth. His name was Boaz. Boaz means strength. Right away, you can tell that uh, this man is a type of Christ. Uh, something interesting I thought you should know about Boaz is Boaz's father was Salmon. Salmon married Rahab. Rahab is a Canaanite. Boaz is already half Canaanite, half Gentile. He is sympathetic to people that are not Jewish or only partly Jewish because he'd probably experienced a little bit of that. Not only was his mother Rahab a Canaanite, she had another reputation. You all know about that? She's called Rahab the harlot in many verses. So Boaz probably could empathize with people that might feel like outcasts. But he is a godly man. In the same way that his mother Rahab adopted the God of Israel, he grew up believing in that God. Now look at some of the ways that you would find, and I, I don't have time to read every verse in the chapter, but I want to see how you can highlight the ways that Boaz is a type of Christ. As we read the different verses, it says that he, first of all, is from Bethlehem. 
where Jesus is from. He is a near kinsman to the ones that need redemption. The Bible tells us that uh, Jesus is our near kinsman. You can read about that in Hebrews 2, verse 17. His name means strength. Jesus is the epitome of the ultimate strength. It says he's rich. Our Father is rich in houses and lands. He is blessed. When he appears in the story, the reapers call him the blessed of the Lord. It te- and you can read that. The Lord bless you, Ruth 2, uh, verse 4. It tells us that he's wise. He knows everything going on in his field. When he talks to Ruth, he says, I know all about you. He had been asking, too. It says he knew all she had done in verse 11. It tells us he's generous. He re- repeatedly he tells Ruth, Ruth, you reap in my field, and when she, during lunch you come and you eat with the servants that eat, and he continues to give. He's experienced. You know, the Bible tells us that Ruth is a young woman. Three times I think it calls her a young woman. So not long after she was married, her husband died. Uh, Boaz says, blessed are you, you have not gone after uh, other men young or old. Now, Boaz is probably older. When you look at the genealogy in the Bible, we know how long it was. We know Rahab lived during the time, about 1406, when uh, the spies crossed over, right? They entered the Promised Land. That's about when that, 1406 B.C. We know that Obed is the uh, son of Ruth and Boaz, who is a father of Jesse. And you can kind of track the time their lifespan cover. He must have been an older man, maybe 50 years old. You know, we can only guess. And don't think that's too creepy because back then, you know, Abraham got married even after Sarah died. They used to live a lot longer. Joshua, I think, lived about 110 years. So a man wasn't always in his prime at 30 back then. They, they lived a little longer. So he had experience. And he's called the Lord of the Harvest. Matthew 9, 38, Jesus is the Lord of the Harvest. He's the only qualified Redeemer that is willing. So he is a type of Christ in many ways. By the way, there was one judge. If you look in Judges chapter 12, there was one judge and his name was Ibzan of Bethlehem, who judged Israel seven years. Some, uh, I read some commentaries, they say this may have been Boaz, who was also a judge. Uh, it's not a strong case for that, but it is interesting. And then when he meets Ruth out in the field and she's harvesting, he says, look, I'm going to watch over you. I've told the young men not to bother you. Sometimes they chase away if they get too many poor people. Or if the young girls, if they're out there by themselves unprotected in these big fields, uh, they might uh, be mistreated. And Boaz says, I've told the young man not to mistreat you, not to harass you. You'll be protected here. Stay in my field. So Boaz is telling her to stay in my field and you'll be okay. I've heard about how you've accepted the God of Israel and you've watched over Naomi. So he watches out for her. She finds grace. She bows before him and says, I'm a foreigner and you're showing me mercy. And he says, yes, I understand. So then he offers her bread and wine. Now, if you look in Ruth chapter 2, verse 7, she says, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and she's continued from morning until now. She's a hard worker, goes early. And she's rested a little in the house. So you see that she's in the house of Boaz. Then Boaz says to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not glean in another field. Don't go from here. Stay here. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap. Go after them. Have not I commanded the men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men draw from the well. She fell on her face and bowed down to the ground. Here she is like worshiping him. Why have I found favor in your eyes? That's that grace. To take notice of me since I'm a foreigner. And Boaz says, I've heard about what you've done. Verse 12, the Lord repay your work and full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. She had accepted the God of Jehovah. Your God is my God. Notice that phrase, under whose wings. It comes up again. That's a term that's used by Moses talking about how God delivered his people from Egypt like an eagle Uh, bears its young on its wings. 
And Boaz said, now at mealtime, verse 14, come here and eat the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. It also says that word there is wine. So here you've got Boaz providing for Ruth bread and wine. Now, what does a woman represent in Bible analogies? A church. Here you've got a very interesting story of these two women who are joined together by a commitment Boaz ends up redeeming them both. One is a Gentile, one is a Jew. You get over to the New Testament, you're going to find out that uh, more Gentiles end up accepting Jesus than Jews. Bo but the church is composed of both. And so it's like this is a, an allegory of what was going to happen with the church in the New Testament. But don't miss Boaz provides the bread and the wine during a harvest. Kind of like Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. It's a symbol like Jesus gave the wine and the bread type of his body. It says she ate and she was satisfied. What Jesus gives us satisfies. Amen, friends? So she rose up again to glean. And Boaz commanded the young man. I think he, he thinks, boy, she's, she's a hard worker. She's a virtuous woman. And uh, she's good looking too. He tells his reapers, he says, let some extra sheaves fall on purpose. So it's like they're, you know, they're, going, they're throwing stuff, they're dropping some for Ruth to pick up after them. Also let grain from the bundle fall purposely for her. Does God give us bread? Does he bless us so that our cup runs over? Extra. Did Jesus multiply the bread and were there leftovers? He overblessed them. So she gleaned in the field that evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. That's like a five-gallon bucket of barley, a lot more than you would normally get um, after winnowing some barley just from gleaning. And she took it up, and she went and showed it to her mother-in-law, and Naomi says, wow, you did really well. Where were you today? Well, I was in the field of a man named Boaz. And Naomi goes, Boaz? He's one of our, our relatives. He's a cousin. He's got the right to redeem us. She says, God is blessing us. Something's going on. Stay close by the women of Boaz and glean until the end of the barley harvest. Now, by the way, the barley harvest happened between Passover and Pentecost. So even the time of the year for this story is talking about when Jesus, between when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven is the context, is the window of time in the Jewish calendar of when this happened. From the time of the Passover to Pentecost. Isn't that interesting? That's right when the barley harvest took place. So even the time when the church was born is the time of year this all happens. So she is committed to dwell and, and to work in the field of Boaz. And uh, he takes care of her. Then Naomi, chapter 3 now. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said, My daughter, shall I not seek security, seek rest for you, that it might be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women were with, uh, who you were with, He's our relative. In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor after they gathered the grain and they beat it out. And when there was a breeze at night, they'd throw it in the air. The chaff would blow away. They'd save the grain and they'd separate it. That's where they went. And they had a big flat paved area where they would do this so that they could separate it and keep it clean from dirt. And they used to guard their grain at night and they would all sleep nearby these heaps of grain until the harvest was done and they could put up the, the grain. And so Naomi gives her some interesting instructions. She said, therefore, you're going to go tonight to the threshing floor. Usually just the men were there. Wash yourself. You're going to go present yourself. You want Boaz to propose to you. But you're going to have to hint proposal. That still happens today. Amen? <laughs> therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Now, you remember what I said. In order for him to redeem what belonged to her family that had been mortgaged to some uh, bank, um, he would also have to marry her to raise up children in the name of Elimelech. And so part of the redemption meant a marriage. Uh, does the Bible talk about marriage in the context of salvation? the harvest and a marriage, the wedding supper of the Lamb. He says, I've gone to prepare a mansion for you. That's all in the language of the Hebrew wedding. 
says, wash yourself. Now, if we're going to present ourselves to Jesus, what do you want to do? Isaiah says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings. Learn how to do good, cease to do evil. And a lot of verses I could go to to talk about we should be washed. Of course, we can't be washed by ourselves, we're washed by the Lord. Anoint yourself. You'll find this, these terms are used in the Bible here. You can read in James 4, verse 8, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. As far as anointing, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God. So there's a washing and an anointing that takes place. And what else? He said, put on a new garment, your best garment. Revelation 19, verse 8, And to her was granted, the church, to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And she says, go to him and then submit to him. Go to his feet. Cover yourself. And then it says she's there at his feet. He blesses her and uh, he answers her petition. So let's go back now and read that real quick. But notice all of the, the Bible language that's used in this passage. So she obeys her mother-in-law. She says, all that you say, I'm in verse 5 of chapter 3, I will do. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed. She's washed and she's anointed and she's got her best clothes on. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, that's a good time to propose, if you're thinking of it. Feed him first. And his heart was cheerful. He went down and to lay at the heap of grain and she came softly during the night. It's dark now. She uncovered his feet while he's snoring. He's sleeping. And she lay down at his feet. What does it symbolize a woman at the feet of Jesus? Do we find Mary many times at the feet of Jesus? Isn't that a symbol of being submitted? We worship at his feet. They bowed. They held him by the feet. And so here it's, it's an act of submission. No, I'm not telling all the wives you got to go lay down at your husband's feet. This is the language of uh, redemption. It's talking about the Lord. So she lays at his feet. And um, now what happened at midnight, he goes to turn himself. The man is startled. He feels something warm down his, by his feet. <laughs> There's a woman lying at his feet. And he says, who are you? <laughs> it's dark. She says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Ah, now it settles in what she's thinking. And he's not at all bothered by that. He had been thinking the same thing. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. Jesus is the one who blesses. For you've shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. Notice, Ruth, could, she could just walk away from Naomi and marry whoever she wants. She is marrying who she needs to marry to save Naomi. See what's happening? How many young ladies here would say, I'm not going to marry who I happen to fall in love with, but I'm going to marry who my mother-in-law needs. My ex-mother-in-law, because <laughs> the husband's dead. That's uh, a beautiful story, isn't it? He said, you're blessed because you could have gone after young men or old men, but you've not done this. And now, my daughter, do not fear. Jesus tells us, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you request. Do we need to make requests of the Lord? Jesus said, up till now you've asked nothing. Ask that your joy may be full. I will do for you all your requests. For all the people know that you are a virtuous woman. Same words you find in Proverbs 31 that describes this picture of the church in the perfect woman. How many of you have read Proverbs 31? If you use that as your checklist for finding a wife, you'll never be married because it is talking about the perfect woman and it describes her who can it says who can find a virtuous woman her price is above rubies it's a beautiful soliloquy there but um, it's really a metaphor for the church that is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing now it is true that I am a close relative he says but we've got some red tape here there is a relative closer than me who actually has first right stay this night, and it'll be in the morning, that if he will not perform the duty of the close relative, I'll do that. So she arose before one could recognize another. There you've got a resurrection very early in the morning happening. 
And he fills her with grain and sends her back with more food. He's not going to let her go away hungry. And he ends up giving her even more than she got before. So she comes to her mother-in-law and tells her everything that happened. I'm racing through chapter 3. And her mother-in-law said, Sit still, my daughter. God told the children of Israel, Stand still and watch God's salvation. Sometimes you think, How are we going to be redeemed? You do what you can and then stand still and watch God's salvation. Sometimes we just need patience. But Naomi knows something about men. She says, The man will not rest until he has concluded this matter this day. Men are task-oriented. Uh, Boaz has got something on his mind. He's going to take care of it right away. Sure enough, next morning, Boaz goes to the gate of the city when the people are going out of Bethlehem, and that's where all the business transactions were uh, taken care of. You can see Daniel sitting in the gate, and Mordecai in the gate, and many others are in the gate. And he sees this man who's unnamed. He's another blood relative. He's actually closer. But Boaz suspects he doesn't want to perform the right because this man is married and Boaz is not. And this man probably doesn't want an extra wife. I'm sure his wife doesn't want him to have an extra wife. <laughs> that I know. And so he says, hey, come on, sit down, brother. He said, I got to talk to you. He said, uh, you know, Naomi's back now. And, and um, she's looking for someone to help redeem her property because uh, she had to mortgage it. And you're next in, kin to, uh, next in line to redeem it. And he said, I'll do it. And then Boaz says, oh, but there is a little bit, uh, there's one little thing you ought to know about, that in order to do that, you also have to take the widow of um, Chilion and marry her to raise up seed for Elimelech. He goes, oh, uh, no, I can't do that. He said, all right, then, let's gather the elders together. If you're not going to perform the rite of redemption, he said, I will perform the rite of redemption. And they got the elders of the city to come together. And in the presence of all the elders, this guy takes off his shoe. They actually, you can read about this in the Bible. They had a custom where they take off the shoe and they make a covenant. And it meant, you know, I'm standing on this. There's some symbolism there. And they all, he said, you are witnesses. Everything that belonged to Elimelech, I will mortgage. I'll pay it off. And I will then buy it. And I'll also take Ruth to be my wife. You all witnesses? They say, we are witnesses. And so Boaz, he gets that all settled, and he passes off, passes on the news to Ruth. And no doubt they had a big wedding. And it, you can go to chapter uh, 4. All the elders of the gate, verse 11, said, We are witnesses. Now notice the blessing they make. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, that you may prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Wow. Was that prophecy fulfilled? Were the descendants of Boaz famous in Bethlehem? Like worldwide, right? I mean, everyone in the world knows about Jesus who came out of Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez. This is one of the sons of Judah from twins who Tamar bore. Interesting, they don't say the other brother because Jesus comes through the line of Perez. Who Tamar bore Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you from this young woman. There it says young again. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And obviously now they're all able to move into Boaz, and they own Elimelech's property and Boaz's property. It says, And the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and his name will be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life. Is Jesus a restorer of life for us? May he be a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons that uh, has borne him. You know, there are seven miraculous births in the Bible of baby boys that are all types of Jesus. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom, and she became a nurse to him. It doesn't mean she literally nursed him. It means she became a nanny. She said, oh, no, he's my baby. She adopted him. And all the neighbor women gave him the name. It's Naomi didn't name him. Boaz didn't name him. The neighbor women named him. What does a woman represent? There is born to Naomi a son. They called him Obed, which means servant. One of the titles for Jesus, he is called the servant. My servant will deal prudently. And it says, Obed, he is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. 
And then it takes an excerpt that later appears in the book of Matthew. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram. Ram begat Aminadab. Aminadab begat Neashen. Neashen begat Salmon. Salmon very likely was one of the spies that Joshua sent to Jericho who married Rahab, who gives birth to Boaz, which means in the family tree of Jesus, you've got, uh, in the story of Ruth, you've got um, Rahab and Ruth, a Canaanite and a Moabite. And that's why Paul tells us in the New Testament, he is a Jew who is not one outwardly, but one inwardly, because we are all adopted in, and we become receivers and partakers of the promises that God made in this book. Amen? Isn't that miraculous, friends? Am I seeing things? Oh, by I didn't finish. Boaz begat Obed. Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David. We're not sure who wrote the book of Ruth. May have been Nathan the prophet. David was a writer. Uh, no doubt Naomi lived to see. Uh, it's possible Naomi lived to see Jesse. Ruth certainly did. This story was passed on very directly. That's why you've got all these intimate details of the conversation. But God inspired it because it's really telling us about salvation. It's about a wedding feast. It's about redemption. It's about a harvest. And these are the themes. We need to be redeemed. Amen?